Hello everyone, welcome to the first video of my channel. My name is the only TMN2 and it's a pleasure to be here on YouTube. For this video, I will be taking an in-depth look of a fallen animation studio, one that spawned from the greatest conflict between the titans of Disney and Pixar. I bring to you Circle 7 Animation. In the early 1990s, Walt Disney Feature Animation hit the scene with films of critical and financial praise. Under a grand portfolio of Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, and The Lion King, Disney was the must-watch studio for animated stories. Even that wasn't enough. There was an even grander weapon on the back of that portfolio. A $26 million contract with computer graphics pioneer, Pixar. Known for their CGI software, RenderMan, Pixar gave studios a tool to create computer visual effects which would inevitably shift the film industry as a whole. The revolutionary graphics from films like Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, and The Abyss were all made possible by Pixar's RenderMan. Under the contract, Disney had the bragging rights to the first ever computer animated film, Toy Story. The result meshes well as Toy Story becomes the highest grossing and most praised film of 1995. The success was so good that it would extend the contract from three films to seven films, all of which had great success. Finding Nemo surpassed The Lion King as the biggest animated film of its time. Rival studios such as DreamWorks and Blue Sky came into play, and traditional animation was seen as obsolete. Pixar became a juggernaut in the film industry, and it would seem that Disney would be so proud of it. Turns out, that was not the case. In January of 2004, Pixar chairman Steve Jobs announced that Pixar would not be renewing its contract with the Walt Disney Company. While Cars and The Incredibles would go under Disney, Ratatouille, Wally, Up, and any future films would go under a new distributor. Previously, Disney and Pixar had to dispute whether or not Toy Story 2 would count in the contract, particularly for how animated sequels at the time fared. The disarrangement got even more since Pixar asked for more profits upon the 10-month negotiation trial. Considering that Disney's own animations were failing, and that the juggernaut Pixar would get even more strength, the partnership just did not bode well for Disney. It was at that moment that the animation titans were no longer allies, but rivals. However, from the grave peril came a new studio to shine for all. Shortly after the announcement, news brought to light that Disney was seeking jobs in Glendale, California, home of two other Disney studios, Disney Toon Studio and KBC TV. Circle 7 was going to be the third sister studio of that location, with a crew of 168 employees from Disney Animation, Disney TV, and Disney Toon Studio. Circle 7 was ready to follow Pixar with their own theatrical sequels. While Pixar owns the intellectual rights of their films, the previous contract gave Disney the franchise rights, whether it be theme park rights, merchandise, or sequels. Thus, Disney CEO Michael Eisner announced the production of Toy Story 3, led by The Lion King 1.5 director Bradley Raymond and Treasure Planet producer Roy Conley. While hard at work, employees of Circle 7 were bringing in drafts to kickstart the project. Bill and Cherry Steinkellner, Co-creators of Teacher's Pet would bring in the first draft, which would be a whodunit style plot where Woody's gang searches for stolen toys from the attic of Andy's grandmother. Despite being scrapped, the script would be considered for a possible Toy Story 4 film. Circle 7 would then find its final script by Meet the Parents writer Jim Hertzfeld, with touch-ups by novice writers Rob Muir and Bob Hilgenberg. In the final script, Toy Story 3 would be about Buzz being sent to Taiwan, after a malfunction in his voice chip. Through the internet, Woody's gang finds out that a global recall for defective Buzz Lightyear toys was in effect. They would be destroyed and replaced with new ones. While Buzz is at the factory, Waka Waka, he meets a few recalled toys including his replacement and nemesis, Dax Blastar. The other toys include Jay, Cindy Scissors, Apology Bear, Don BB, Little D, Andy Hands, and Rosie. As for Woody's gang, they ship themselves to Taiwan to find the factory, all while getting themselves trapped in a daycare, to which they later escape. 
Finally, they come to the factory, only to see a severely damaged Buzz, who was on his way to the compactor. Afterwards, Dax Blastar comes to attack them, only for Woody's gang to win. While the story was heavily recycling from Toy Story 2's plot, switching Buzz and Woody's positions, the concept art suggests this movie was going to be way more action-based and epic scale than its predecessors. The script also had a lot more adult jokes, suggesting that the film would have gone from a G rating of its predecessors to a PG rating. Production aside, Circle 7 would then start promoting the film next year. They unveiled a poster in Zagraf 2005 with a declared release date in Spring 2008. Tim Allen was willing to return as Buzz, and a test clip with a line from Tom Hanks suggests that Circle 7 was working to get the original cast on board. Here is the only known footage of Circle 7 animation, produced by Joe White. Are you crying? No. Are you crying? Oh. Are you crying? <laughs> There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. While the animation wasn't finalized with three more years of production, it just wasn't going to reach Pixar's level. The animation appears to take the middle ground approach of direct-to-DVD and theatrical quality. Despite the lack of Pixar's technology, Circle 7 did seem comfortable for what they had, with even more films on the way. The next in line for Circle 7 were Monsters Inc. 2, Lost in Scaradise, in an untitled Finding Nemo sequel trademarked as Nemo 2. While neither film had known directors, the former had Rob Muir and Bob Hilgenberg from Toy Story 3 as writers, while the latter had Laurie Craig, known for writing Polly and Ella Enchanted. Lost in Scaradice was scheduled for a spring 2009 release, while Nemo 2 would be released in 2010, both being theatrical. Close to the video's date, Rob Muir revealed the entire plot of his film in an interview with YouTuber Hema Studios. In summary, Lost in Scaradice would start off with Mike practicing his proposal for a marriage with Celia, and a stressed Sully seeking to relive the days he spent with Boo. The two decide to revisit Boo again, realizing it had been taken by an elderly lady, and they get lost in the human world, with many hijinks along their adventure. They reunite with their old nemesis Randall, and meet many mythical creatures such as the Jersey Devil and Bigfoot, all of which were previously banished by Waternoose. The mythical creatures tell Mike, Sully, and Randall that they must find Boo's home to return back to the monster world. They eventually see Boo again as hinted by a hidden paper left at the old home, but they learn that humans forget about monsters as they age, creating a new ideal to the Monsters Inc. universe. Throughout the film, the crew is chased by a human hunter named Simon, who eventually gets stopped after a final battle at the Monsters Inc. facility. The film ends happily as Sully retires from CEO position to become a comedic duo with Mike, while seeing Boo for as long as she can remember him. Of the three scripts that Circle 7 put out, Lost in Scaredice's script has been regarded as the best by fans, with large praise going to Muir and Hilgenberg for their commitment for a love letter for Pixar, even with the studio at conflict with their old distributor. Like Lost in Scaredice, Finding Nemo 2 had only one draft, except it has zero concept art available to the public. In summary, the film starts off with Nemo discovering he has a long-lost brother named Remy, who was an abandoned survivor of the Barracuda attack of the first film. Remy can be best regarded as a try-hard version of his brother, one that seeks competition and fighting. Nemo and Remy actually do compete in school, with the former being the smart kid and the latter being the sports kid, to which the whole class prefers. Later on, Marlin and Remy have a fight because the latter claims he was discarded by his own father. It gets worse as Remy gets caught in a net, to which Marlin sacrifices himself. Nemo, Dory, and Remy set a quest to save Marlin, which then ends up at an aquarium named Planet Blue. There are multiple hijinks upon many aquarium exhibits, whether it be Dory exploring what could be her old home, Nemo reuniting with Gil to find Marlin, Remy regretting his words, and Marlin meeting many different animals. More on the journey, Dory would reunite with her family, Nemo and Remy tamed their rivalry, and the animals would help Marlin find an escape. 
The whole crew starts by malfunctioning the filtration system, meeting resistance from the aquarium staff. Bruce the shark joins to help the crew, Dory has her short-term memory loss cured, and Marlin recoups with Nemo and Remy, all before they escape the aquarium. The original gang, now with Remy, end the movie by swimming back to their old coral reef home. Fighting Nemo 2 had the least development of the Circle 7 films, and the script definitely favors retcon moments as opposed to actually having a compelling story. But considering that there were 5 more years of production, the script could have been way more different if it was greenlit. What all three films had in common were taking the original for a bigger scale adventure. From the large scale environments to the shifting hijinks, Circle 7 took the route of bigger is better. If this was going to be the case, Disney saw enough potential in Circle 7 that it could recoup the losses of Disney animation with recognizable IPs alone. That reality came quick to an end. On September 30th, 2005, Disney CEO Michael Eisner resigned from the Walt Disney Company after a magnitude of company failures. Box office disasters, plunge in ratings for the channel ABC, the Disney Park crisis, and the final nail to the coffin, Pixar opting out of the contract. As much as Circle 7 gave their employees a special opportunity to work on Pixar's beloved characters, the studio's start was still based in soulless corporatism by Michael Eisner. As executive producer John Lasseter laid it out, it's like you have these dear children and you have to give them up to be adopted by convicted child molesters. Afterwards, Bob Iger would take the place as CEO and make drastic changes to Walt Disney Company falling forward. On January 24th, 2006, Disney announced that they would be acquiring Pixar for $7.4 billion in stock, with the deal finalizing on May 5th, 2006. With the animation titans reunited, Pixar had the right to completely restructure Disney's animation department. Ed Catmull would become the president for the whole division, while John Lasseter became the chief creative officer. Disney Animation would have more CGI films with updated technology, and Disney Toon would give up sequels in favor of spin-offs. This spelled danger for Circle 7. Unfortunately, the inevitable would come very shortly. In a conference, Ed Catmull announced that Circle 7 animation would be closing permanently. 136 of the employees would be transferred to Disney Animation, while the rest would seek new jobs outside of Disney or join Disney Toon Studios. After a few weeks of arrangements, Circle 7 Animation would close on May 26, ending a staple of the Eisner era. While Pixar claims to not have read any of the Circle 7 scripts, they did take management of Toy Story 3 for themselves, delaying the film from 2008 to the summer of 2010. Monsters Inc. 2 and Finding Nemo 2 would be cancelled, only to be revived later as Pixar's own films. There's speculation that the scripts may have brought inspiration anyway, such as the trash compactor in Toy Story 3, or the aquarium setting in Finding Nemo 2. As for Circle 7's notable employees, Rob Muir and Bob Hilgenberg would co-write the screenplay for The Great Fairy Rescue, directed by Toy Story 3's Bradley Raymond. The film itself got decent reviews. To this day, Muir and Hilgenberg share their experiences at Circle 7 through videos and comments. Roy Conley would go on to produce Tangled in Big Hero 6. Bill and Cherry Steinkellner would become separate producers until going on hiatus after 2012. Lori Craig would become a story consultant of Rio 2. Toy Story 3 would be Jim Hertzfeld's final project. The fate of Circle 7's headquarters is unknown, but it most likely merged as a backup studio to Disney Toon, which itself would close permanently in 2018. While Circle 7 did rip off Pixar's properties, and it did spawn from a corporate battle between Disney and Pixar, they did still bring influence to both companies. Animated sequels were a profitable choice for Pixar, spin-offs by Disney could still coexist, such as planes and monsters at work. Michael Eisner could have kept good terms with Pixar back then. Pixar could have partnered with Warner Brothers and competed with Disney. But Circle 7 will always be a highlight of the biggest animation conflict yet. Thank you all for opting in my very first video. If there are any improvements to make, please let me know in the comments. Suggestions for future videos are also available to comment. In the future, I plan for more video essays like this, but there's even more to come. Gameplay videos via stream or edited, chat streams, short vlogs, and maybe even podcasts. I won't be stopping from there. 
See you all next time.